Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, How to Specify Cable Cleats, Understanding How IEC Compliance Can Mitigate Short Circuit Disasters and Future-Proof Your Infrastructure, sponsored by Panduit. I'm your moderator, Amara Rasgis, and I'm happy to be with you today on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or the audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, please click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. But if you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for our speakers in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A session will begin at the end of the prepared presentation. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of this presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Those documents also will be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. Now we'll hear from the sponsor of today's webcast, Panduit. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. In today's industrial work environment, staying compliant with constantly changing rules, regulations, and standards can be a drain on resources and even a crippling distraction for your business. But with Panduit as your partner, you have the confidence that comes from using products built by a company with over 60 years of experience in electrical infrastructure. A company with a global ecosystem of partners. A company in a unique position to offer revolutionary solutions that minimize human error, ensure electrical safety, and comply with industry standards around the world. A trusted resource for simplifying business and inspiring confidence in your workforce. Sometimes with just a push of a button. The leader in modern electrical infrastructure is now the leader in modern electrical safety. Thanks to Panduit for supporting today's event. I'm happy to introduce today's presenters, Fred Dorman and Andy Booth. Fred Dorman is the director of the Cable Cleat business for Panduit. In this role, he is responsible for managing the engineering, technical support, development, and execution of the global sales plan for the business unit. He's the liaison and champion in supporting the sales team with marketing, key customer relationships, distributor management, VOC, and product development. Dorman has a BS in mechanical engineering and manufacturing management from Valparaiso University. Fred is well-versed in cable cleats, grounding, stainless steel, and cable ties. Andy Booth is the technical engineer for Panduit. In this role, he is responsible for the cable cleat market and assists in the development of new cable cleat solutions technical knowledge, and market feedback. Booth has been elected as a U.S. expert on the committee responsible for overseeing the IEC 61914 standard on cable cleats regarding short circuit force, compliance standard for safety, and best practices. Andy has a master's degree in leadership of innovation from York University. 
Andy is also well-versed in cable cleats in IEC 61914. Thank you for presenting for us today, gentlemen. Fred, let's get started. Thank you, Amara. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to review the cable cleat standards and how to specify cable cleats with IEC. Some of our learning objectives today, we will start out by going over what is a short circuit. We'll discuss how cable cleats help mitigate a short circuit event in your facility. We'll follow up with how the NEC code and the IEC code interact and address cable cleats and short circuit mitigation. And then we'll close off with how describing how the IEC fills the gaps that are left by the NEC code. And most importantly, we'll tie back into why this is important to you for your designs and for your infrastructure needs. A short circuit event when it occurs is an accidental conductive connection between two or more points of a circuit. When this happens, it creates a tremendous electromagnetic force. The result is often violent and catastrophic. It can damage equipment and personnel and put the infrastructure in the facility at risk. In the photos depicted, you can see a a uh, display that shows where a contractor accidentally broke through the street and came in contact with some underground cabling resulting in a short circuit event. This is one example of a practical example of how short circuit events occur in the field. The following pictures and several subsequent slides will show stim still images from very high speed resolution cameras during testing that we do for the short circuit cable cleats. This slide shows what happens when a cleat fails. Fortunately, this is a test setup in a lab and also uh, shows a little bit clearer of what the, the violence that occurs with the electrical magnetic force. Subsequently, here's an example, a little bit clearer still image of what a cable cleat test setup looks like in the lab for a rig fixture. You can see that the cables are neatly contained within the ladder rack and cable tray. They are aligned and everything is safe as it should be. Post in intentional failure test, you can see where the cables have flown out of the cable tray, uh, breaking the cleats, damaging the cable tray, as well as potentially damage anything that would be in the facility near this equipment and cause even further damage. So now that we've shown you what a short circuit event is and some of the impacts, let's talk a little bit further about what some of the common causes are of a short circuit event or a short circuit fault. So the first stage in a short circuit event is usually when the insulation breaks down. Insulation on a cable can break down from the day it was made due to installation, mechanical degradation, thermal degradation, and environmental uh, caustic environment and things of that nature. The majority of the things that cause the cables to break down is a mechanical event. Mechanical forces will be applied to the cable through all stages of its life, whether it's installed or during its application. Looking at the photos at the bottom of the slide, going from the left to the right, you can see a couple of examples very similar to the first example I showed you, where there was a puncture of an underground cable that resulted in a short circuit event. The center slide, the center photo in the slide, excuse me, shows some cabling that was in a, a utility tunnel that was lifted up out of the cleat during a temporary installation of some additional cabling. As you can see there, the cable is resting on one of the threaded stud rods. So you can suspect what happened after time, that that threaded rod eventually wore through the installation, created a short circuit fault path back to earth or to ground, and resulted in a short circuit event. Next to the last to the right of the slides, you can see some very large cables that were worn down to the point where they created a short circuit event. This occurred unfortunately in an offshore environment where we had an oil rig next to an FPSO and with the constant rocking of the tide over several months of time, eventually the cables wore through the and the transit wore through the insulation and resulted in a short circuit event. So now that we've covered and reviewed some common causes of short circuit events, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Andy Booth, to discuss a little bit more in detail what a cable cleat is and some of the standards regarding cable cleats. Andy, I'll turn it over to you now. 
Okay, Fred, thank you very much for that. Um, the first slide we have here is quite simply a definition. What is a cable cleat? And we have taken this from the international standard IEC 61914. A cable cleat simply is a device designed to provide securing of cables when installed at intervals along the length. So it can be anything, any material, any physical size, any um, the different ways that you can capture a cable. The IEC does not discriminate or does not um, specify a certain type. As long as it secures the cables along the length, we can class it as a cable cleat. The examples along the bottom of the screen there are taken directly from the IEC, and they've got um, different materials such as aluminium, stainless steel, timber, polymer. Uh, the examples given in the blue circles are taken from the Panduit, the new family of cable cleats from Panduit. If we take a look at what actually happens in a short circuit, we see the sine wave, the waveform of a phase-to-phase -phase fault, far from generator. And there are two important factors here. First of all, the first peak, so that first rise of that sine wave to give us IP, that is the peak short circuit in kiloamps, Ka. And then if we look at the x-axis, the timing, that's in seconds. So if we have a steady state AC um, arrangement, we get 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Where we've got that first peak, that is quarter of a cycle. So on a 50 hertz system, we're talking five milliseconds to that first peak. And the most destructive and the highest forces occur at that peak. Um, that occurs within five milliseconds. A very quick circuit breaker will jump in perhaps at three cycles, maybe five cycles. It has to, first of all, recognize the fault. It then has to act to trip the fault and cut the circuit. At that point, the cable cleat and the cables have seen the destructive forces that Fred has just been speaking about. Quite often we see on a cable specification one or three seconds for a short circuit withstand. That is purely to do with the cable, the heat and the current that it can carry, it's I squared T. So it's the amount of heat that the cable can carry for one or three seconds. We worry about five milliseconds regarding the performance of the cable cleat. So if we look at the NEC, the National Electrical Code in North America, um, many people will design and specify their installations according to the NEC. Article 392.20 asks for all single conductors to be securely bound in circuit groups to prevent excessive movement due to fault current magnetic forces. So it recognizes this phenomenon. There are many other articles as well throughout the NEC which also recognize the electromagnetic forces at the peak of the fault. But what it doesn't do is tell you how to restrain those forces. And that's where the IEC 61914 comes into play. What we have to do as a manufacturer of cable cleats is rigorously test all of our cleats um, according to certain conditions. The first one there is according to temperature rating. So we can declare a minimum or a maximum temperature for each one of our cable cleats, starting down at minus 60, going up to 120 degrees C. We have to test it for flame propagation or resistance to flame propagation, very similar to a UL standard where we apply a needle flame and um, we test for the, the dripping of the plastic onto a tissue paper and we look at flame propagation. The top view there is, or sorry, the bottom view there is the lateral load testing. So we can, um, what we do, we assemble three cables into that cable cleat and basically we pull the cable cleat apart. We test the loop strength of that cable cleat and that is declared at the maximum temperature. It doesn't really, um, apply to a metallic cleat as such, but you can imagine for an old polymer cleat up at 120 degrees, it acts very differently 
to what it would at room temperature. So we put that whole assembly in a, an air circulating oven and we test at the maximum declared temperature. The top view there shows the axial load testing, which again is done at maximum temperature, where we simulate the cables trying to push through that cable cleat. So we assemble the mandrels in the cleat and we push or pull those mandrels through the cleat. Um, as soon as the cables start to move or the mandrels start to move through the cleat, we uh, are allowed five millimeters of movement before that test is a fail. What we do then, we go back and we, uh, we lower the force and we try again so we can get to the maximum axial retention force. We do an impact resistance test, this time at the lowest declared temperature. That's important when you have uh, a polymer cleat, perhaps glass filled, which, uh, or whose properties are completely different at say minus 40. So we declare that at the lowest temperature and we drop a known uh, weight from a known height onto the weakest part of the cleat to see if we can fracture that. We test against accelerated weathering. So we look at corrosion and UV resistance. And we also look at the electromechanical forces, which Fred has spoken about already. So we have three cables, sometimes in touching trefoil, sometimes in spaced flat formation. But essentially, we have three cables and we need a minimum of five cable cleats on our rig. We look after and we secure the end conditions to make sure we don't unzip from one end or the other of the rig. Uh, we induce the short circuit by attaching all three phases to a length of copper buzz bar. And at the connection end, we connect a generator. We induce a, a three phase short circuit. Um, after that test, we register the peak or during the test, sorry, we register the peak of the short circuit. We then hang on to that decaying RMS for at least 0 0.1 of a second. And we then look at the rig. We are not allowed any loose or missing components, and we cannot damage the cable at all. If we achieve that, then we've achieved what we class as a category one pass, a one hit pass. If things are still looking okay, we can hit that rig again with exactly the same fault level or as close as we can get to it. Um, again, after that second short circuit, we look for any damage to the cable. We're allowed no. Um, loose or missing components, but then we disconnect the rig and we spray the entire rig with water for at least two minutes. And we then attach basically a voltage withstand check. So we apply 2.8 kV DC for one minute or one kV AC, and we check for any voltage drop. If we don't get any voltage drop, then we've achieved a category two pass. Um, and that is a really onerous test. It's a, a, as well as the others, which are important, that's a very, very difficult um, test to pass. Um, a brief history of the standard. It started as a European standard, BSEN 50368, back in 2003. When it was published, um, we opened it up to an international audience and it was adopted and we work towards the first edition, which was released in 2009 of the IEC. We did further work on that first edition, and we released the second revision in 2015. And we are currently working on some further improvements, possibly to cover um, HV cables and other aspects, which the, the standard doesn't cover at the moment, just to make it a stronger standard going forward. So just a quick overview, a quick summary of what we've spoken about. We now know what a cable cleat is. We have a device which is designed to provide securing cables, basically. Uh, we now know what happened to cables during an actual fault. Uh, we accept and we acknowledge that faults do happen out in the field. Regardless of other measures, we need to keep hold of those cables with a good cleat and we understand the timing involved, five milliseconds for those most destructive forces. So the key takeaways here is that cleats do mitigate the impact of a short circuit before other items of um, fault protection can react and trip. And the standard 61914 ensures that cable cleats can withstand and protect during that short circuit. So at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Fred. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Andy. I appreciate all the great information on the IEC 61914 standard and all the test methods and methodology. Uh, I hope that the audience can see that we just gave you a very high overview of the test standard, and there's a tremendous amount of detail within the standard. So we could spend an entire day going over all the testing and all the things that are involved with the standard and how to design and install cable cleats to protect against short circuit events and faults. What I'd like to review with the audience now is Panduit's approach of how we took the IEC standard and also used finite element analysis through ANSYS simulation to really capture some of the dynamic uh, loading and the electrical magnetic forces that, uh, that are involved with the short circuit event. So what Panduit has done is we started with a simulation program and with any simulation, you have to validate it with lab testing and verification to prove that your assumptions and your analysis is correct. So through several iterative processes, we developed an ANSYS model, went to a third party independent lab in, in, in Pennsylvania, tested at the Kima facility for short circuit event, readjusted our modeling to uh, closer simulate what happens in real world conditions. And then we get into the simulation details and what this really allows uh, anyone to do who's designing a cable cleat for the IEC standards is to really improve the quality of their design and the speed of which they design a product. With that, I'd like to bring over to the next slide. And I'd just like to make a comment that several of these slides coming up are from uh, ANSYS simulation models, uh, video clips, as well as uh, high speed uh, photography during actual short circuit event testing. So for the purpose of this presentation, we obviously are using still images captured from those videos. If you do have further interest in that, uh, we do have all that information available on our website where you can see the detailed uh, chema testing as well as the short circuit simulation. So what this slide is showing in the upper left-hand circle is the multi-physics simulation which is showing the forces of, of what happens during a short circuit event. You can also see the graph uh, in the center of the slide that shows the test pattern that we're using, very similar to the sine wave formation that Andy uh, referenced in the earlier uh, few slides ago. But more importantly also what we're able to model is the magnetic field vectors. And so while it may look on the surface just as a slightly different color, what it actually does is, is align the magnitudes in all the different directions of the forces that occur during a short circuit event. And this is really critical when designing and developing a cleat because this, recall that this all occurs within five to six milliseconds. All these forces are being applied before the fault protection will, clip, will kick in. One thing to note is that the simulation that we did do in the ANSYS uh, software program, we did submit to the ANSYS group and that we were very pleased to announce that for 2019, they gave us an ANSYS best in class award for the use of their software and all the modeling that we did develop for this program. So as I mentioned in the process, we have to do what's called testing lab verification of our model. So in the left-hand side of the screen, you can see one of our buckle strap cleats uh, it's a still shot of the ANSYS simulation. And then what's in the upper right-hand corner is the test rig. And you can see we passed because the, the cleats did not come apart, as well as the subsequent uh, DC current test after the short circuit event. Here's one of the polymer one-hole cleats, uh, both in an ANSYS simulation and in a test rig setup. So again, this was a, a scenario that, that where we did perform the ANSA simulation to the targeted uh, kiloamp short circuit current rating, and then went and did the test rig up setup to show that the simulation does support and does validate the process and to get KEMA approval and IEC rating. So it's great we showed some examples of success, but also it's very important to learn from your failures as well. So in the modeling process, we would continue to exercise the program to bring our cleats to failure. 
And then what we did is at the end of the testing, we did set up a several sets of rigs to prove to ourselves that the models we had had together that show the failure of the short circuit uh, of the cleat during a short circuit event also occurs in the same way. So if you look at the circular inset of the of the finite element analysis and the and the halfway uh, and the the, the halfway point of the bottom bracket in the middle, you can see that that cleat actually failed in the middle. Whereas if we look at the uh, larger screen, which is a screenshot of the actual short circuit event, you can see that the cleat failed in the exact same way. My apologies. Uh, Another failure example was for one of our aluminum cleats in a trefoil formation. As you can see in the lower inset, we also took it to maximum failure and as well uh, positioned the cleat and the, and the rig set up for ultimate testing as a failure, and it also proved out that it failed in the same way. In addition to catastrophic failures, the IEC 61914 code has a lot of specific verbiage and test parameters that we cannot damage the cable at any point during a short circuit event. So we can also illustrate here that the ANSYS model showed in the lower right-hand corner that we would get a small amount of damage to one of the insulation, uh, insulation on one of the conductors of the three-phase uh, trefoil setup. We then went back and validated this on a test fault setup where it shows that we get the failure uh, on the cable as well was damage to the insulation. So the question may be posed is why take all the time for finite element analysis, multi-physics simulation, to simulate all these dynamic forces? The key thing is there, when you just look at static force equations as outlined in the IEC documentation, that's in a, in a fixed loading setup. It does not account for the dynamics uh, that occur in milliseconds during a short circuit event. So most manufacturers, when we go to design a cable cleat to meet IEC standards, we will do theoretical calculations. We will do some testing in a lab set up with pencil testing. Then we will proceed to build a prototype cleat and move to a test facility to where we can test the short circuit event. Now, if we have a failure, then we have to go back and repeat that whole process. What we we're able to do with this modeling that we've developed is to reduce our design cycle time to where we actually have a cleat that we feel will work in theory. We do do some lab testing, but then we have a higher first pass yield when we go to the third party agency to test the IEC short circuit current ratings. So how this helps the industry and how it helps uh, people looking to install cleats to short circuit or short circuit mitigation is we can actually model using ANSYS software the exact cable tray, cable formation, cable cleat being used at the designated peak short circuit current value to give a simulation of what the real world installation would like be like. This provides assurance and insurance to our clients to know that they have a tested system once installed with cable tray, cable, and cable cleats to meet the short circuit requirements. So as we referenced in the IEC standard earlier, there is a short circuit force calculation. And this force uses the maximum, calculates the maximum force on a conductor using this peak short circuit current rating in kiloamps, as well as the center to center distance for the two neighboring conductors. This is the internationally recognized IEC 61914 2015 standard revision of the force calculation. It's a very straightforward formula, but what it requires you to do is to calculate the force of the short circuit event, compare that to the theoretical tensile strength of the cable cleat, and then calculate the spacing at which you're going to put those cable cleats to divide that force load up. So one of the key things to know is, is that cleat spacing is very, very critical to a properly engineered cable cleat solution. So when you look at 
how to lay this out, it requires a lot of manual calculations that need to be done by the engineering firm. One of the tools that Panduit has developed to support engineers and their function with this is our Cable Cleat app. And what this allows you to do is to select the cable formation, whether it be a tray foil, a uh, parallel flat conductor, or a multi-core uh, conductor cable, specify the peak current amp uh, for the peak short circuit, and then provide the cable diameter, and it will predict for you and explain to you if you install these cleats at this spacing what your rating is. So it's a very uh, helpful tool for engineers and folks out in the field when they're designing these types of installations. So why are cable cleats important? Cable cleats are important to protect against a short circuit event, to protect your facility and your equipment, to protect human life, to future-proof your infrastructure, and really for the client to gain a competitive advantage over their competition by having a, a secure infrastructure system that is reliable and will continue to perform for years to come. So where are cable cleats used and in what markets and in what applications? In short, cable cleats are used at anywhere that three-phase power is transmitted in a cable tray. All these types of industries, whether it be oil and gas, both onshore and offshore, all have kilometers or miles of cabling in cable tray. Any power generation facilities, chemical plants, mining, wind energy. There's typically nine conductors coming down a wind turbine from the nacelle to the base in a trefoil formation. All critical infrastructure opportunities for cable cleat and where we can work together as an industry to ensure safe and power, uh, power distribution throughout. So in summary, Hopefully you've understood today from our discussion with you that short circuits are possible regardless of the precautions put in place. Short circuits will happen. They are unplanned. They can create a tremendous amount of damage. The other key thing that we've touched on, and I hope you picked up on, that the IEC standard started from the British standard in Europe. The European market is a little further ahead than the North American market on the implementation and utilization of cable cleats. As such, compliance with the NEC code calls for specifying protection, as Andy illustrated earlier in the presentation, specifying protection against the impact and electrical mechanical forces of a short circuit event, but it does not specify the how. The how is just as important as calling out the hazard. The how is how to select a cable cleat properly, how to install a cable cleat properly at the proper spacing, and to ensure whoever's cable cleat you, you choose to install, it will meet the test and that's performance. That's why we strongly recommend from Panduit that regardless of whose cable cleat you use, please make sure it is IEC 61914 2015 compliant. That is a very critical thing to ensure that you are protected against the short circuit event. And lastly, just remember that cable cleats provide assurance and insurance to mitigate short circuit events. The key thing with cable cleats is I think of it as life insurance. You buy it hoping you never have to use it, but when you do need it, it's there and it does its job quietly. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Amara to review any sort of questions or anything that might have come in. And I thank everyone for their time and attending the presentation. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, Andy. Our presenters will now answer questions from the audience. We do have some time for questions, so please type your questions in for the presenter in the Ask a Question box on your screen. Please type either Andy's name or Fred's name prior to the question to direct it to that individual. We will get to as many questions as time allows. Questions that we do not get to today will be posted online at www.
www.csemag.com with the archived version of this webcast. Please remember to download a certificate of completion or a copy of the presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Okay, so we have some fantastic questions coming in here from the audience. Fred, I am going to begin with you. You are going to get the first question from the audience. Uh, the question okay. is, are there NEC or NFPA, NEMA, ANSI, or IEEE codes or standards applicable to cable cleat restraint and cable cleats? So I'll start with, thank you for the question. I'll start with the NEC, NFPA uh, section of the question. So the NEC code and the NFPA specifically state in several of the articles that uh, Andy had listed earlier in the presentation that cables shall be installed when they're in a tray, shall be installed in such a manner to protect against the electrical magnetic forces that are created during a short circuit event. They state that. It is then left up to the interpretation whether it be the interpretation is then done by an engineering firm, the contractor on site, or the electrical maintenance person at the chemical plant or the refinery, what is adequate restraining of those cables for an electrical magnetic uh, event during a short circuit fault? So they don't really specify the how. They talk about the why. And that's where IEC 61914 really comes in and will basically provide the documentation through the testing procedure that if your cable cleats are tested to IEC 61914, the latest standard, 2015, it will protect against those electrical magnetic forces. So the recommendation to the industry, whenever using tray foil cabling or parallel cabling runs in a cable tray and you want to protect against short circuit uh, faults or events is to make absolutely certain you're using a cable cleat designed to that standard and the critical thing is and that manufacturer will provide you with a, what we call a published lab report outlining what they tested to and all the test data. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Fred. Andy, I'm going to move the next question over to you. And this is a multi-part question, so I'm gonna ask them all, and then we'll go through them one by one, if that's okay. All right, so okay. the big long question is, how do cable cleats compare to current limiting fuses? And then are cable cleats better suited for a certain voltage or amperage? And then what is typically the cost to use cable cleats? So let's go back a little bit and start with the first one. How do cable cleats compare to current limiting fuses? Okay, well, you know, by virtue of the name, a fuse does limit the current. Any fuse will drop the current as soon as it can. Fuses act much quicker generally than um, a trip or a circuit breaker. The current limited fuses um, are numerous in type. There are semiconductors and um, super, super limiting conductors. But um, the important thing is that as soon as that fault occurs, there is still a moment in time when those cables are moving apart. Now, uh, a current limiting fuse may catch that up to the peak. It may limit the peak of the fault that we saw on the, the initial curve but the cables will still see that initial inertia, that initial movement of forces. So we still need to use cable cleats as well as current limiting fuses. Regarding the question on voltage and amperage, generally, um, well, the IEC standard is written under the Low Voltage Directive, and within 61914, we ask that the cable is low voltage, so 600 to 1 kV, and it is stranded copper, class 2 copper. 
because that cable acts in a certain way. Um, as soon as we start talking about high voltage, um, the cables still see the dynamic forces, but generally with a high voltage cable, we have lots of insulation, XLP insulation, and they act completely differently. And although they may not see the, uh, the movement, the immense movement that the low voltage cable does, because of their self weight and the damage that we can cause to the XLP insulation, we still need to consider cable cleats. Um, so it, it's down to the fault level, it's down to the cleat spacing, and it's down to the cable type. But generally, we don't concern ourselves too much with the voltage, we concern ourselves with the amperage. Regarding cost, um, well, without cleats, the cost in the event of a fault could be enormous. And this is the same, adding cleats to an installation is exactly the same as adding a fault current limiting fuse or a circuit breaker or any other form of protection. So if we consider the cost regarding mitigation of these forces, we have to, it's not just cleats that we need to consider, we need to consider fuses and every other form of protection. A cleat is a form of circuit protection. Thank you. Okay, very good, thank you. And we're gonna kind of follow along those same lines of that this thought process. Fred, the next question is for you. Regarding protection of cables from cleats, and spacing in a cable tray, both vertically and horizontally. Is there a specific situation when cleats should be used? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Absolutely. So it's a great question, and it's often a, a hot topic for discussion out in the, in the industry. So thank you for sharing that question. Uh, firstly, when we look at short circuit mitigation and cable cleat installations to protect against short circuit, Focus on the electromechanical forces that occur during the short circuit event, and then installing the cleats at the spacing you will need per the IEC guidelines to protect against the short circuit event. So the question often comes up, and I'll use millimeters for, for level set conversation. Let's say typical rung spacing is 300 millimeters. And when we do all the calculations and you look at all the test data to protect against a short circuit event, I need to install a cable cleat every 600 or every 900 millimeters, let's say every 900 millimeters. So you're affixing the cable, tray, cable to the cable tray every 900 millimeters. Now, when you look at that installation, yes, that will contain the cable during a short circuit event. However, we know from practical installation that you will need more cable support than that for keeping the cable in the tray, and especially during what we call bends, turns, and risers. Whether you're doing a horizontal 90-degree bend or a 45, or transitioning into a vertical riser, we still recommend putting cable cleats or another type of affixing system, if you don't want to use cable cleats, outside of the cable cleat protection to affix the cable to the tray. So kind of to recap, because I said a lot there and it's a very important topic. When we look at short circuit calculations and installing cleats to mitigate against short circuit, that does not supersede best practices for affixing cable to tray or to the rungs on how it's run and installed. So thank you for that question. That is a very good question. All right, got it. And Fred, I'm actually going to send the next question over to you as well. Um, this is talking about alternative solutions. What are some alternate solutions to Panduit-specific products? So in general, you know, cable cleats is a product category. There are several manufacturers that make cable cleats. In addition to traditional cable cleats like what we've shown in some of the photos, uh, either forged cast aluminum, injection molded plastic, stainless steel bent and formed. Uh, there are other options out there as what we call as like a strap cleat. And a strap cleat is very different than what we would call as a stainless steel cable tie. A stainless steel cable tie is not engineered 
to withstand the short circuit force requirements. A strap cleat has been tested and designed to support all the forces and to contain the cable during a short circuit event. So there's several different materials, as you saw by the IEC code overview that Andy presented at the beginning. Materials are, can be anything from aluminum to polymer to even a block of wood is how cleats started back in the day. But the key thing is there's several different forms, whether it is a one hole, two hole for a flat installation, aluminum polymer, polymer or stainless steel uh, trefoil installation, or a strap cleat that can be used on a multi-core or a trefoil installation. Thank you for the question. Okay, yeah, and Andy, this next question is for you, it, and it, it does follow along the lines of pros and cons and installation. Uh, one of the listed pros for cable cleats is the support of the cables. When it's used in a cable tray application, the cable cleat application does not include a, a cleat at every cable tray rung. How does the cleat provide superior cable support by not providing a cleat at each cable tray rung? Can you talk about that, please? Sure, thank you. I think Fred's covered it in some respect in that um, many cable ladders will be at nine inch or 300 millimeter centers. Um, what we need to do is carry out that calculation or run the installation through multi-physics to find out what the forces might be at each and every point. Sometimes you don't need to support a cable every single rung for every 300 millimeters. That's just adding cost to the installation. If it's a, a moderate or a low fault level and the cables are quite large, you may be able to cleat at every 900 or 1200 millimeters. It all depends on the fault level and it all depends on the size of the cable. Thank you. All right, very good. Uh, Fred, let's send this one over to you. Given okay. the subject is gaining exposure due to the IEC standard, do you foresee that U.S. Uh, authorities having jurisdiction, AHJs, will begin to start calling for supporting documentation for the installer-selected cable fastening means used uh, in cable tray installations in U.S. facilities? So I would certainly hope so. Uh, I, as, and I, I'd like to say a few things and then ask Andy Booth to comment it from his experience from Europe. Uh, but essentially uh, what I'm seeing when I go out on site and I go out in the field, I see miles and miles of power cabling at facilities in tray with no cable ties, nothing on it, and when I talk to uh, the operators in the field, do you guys have short circuit events? Do you experience short circuit events in your facility? And they'll all say sometimes, you know, how frequently? Usually once a year, maybe once every 18 months, something like that. And when we start talking about the need to support the cables and protect them against a short circuit event and really protect the infrastructure, uh, you'll get mixed reactions. Well, yes, we see your point, but the NEC code and the NFPA uh, doesn't, doesn't actually specify. They all talk about the forces, but they don't mandate the use of a cleat, so it's very subjective. So Panduit is actively working uh, with both UL, the National Electrical Code, and NAFPA, uh, to look at ways to strengthen the codes on using cable cleats for any tray installations. Uh, Andy, do you have anything you want to comment, uh, maybe from EMEA's perspective, Europe's perspective, uh, on where yeah, you guys are with Fred. North America? Yeah, thank, th thanks for that, Fred. Yeah, I mean, going back to the European standard back in 2003, I was doing exactly the same, you know, sort of over, well, nearly 20 years ago, where we would go on site and discuss the forces and then show the guys that there was a European and EN standard. And I guess over the years, over the following years, when we had the IEC standard, the knowledge of cable cleats in EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, Africa, um, became really strong. Everyone knew about cable cleats and everyone knows about the the dangers of not using correctly specified cable cleats 
And I think going back to the NEC standard with that one line sort of uh, requirement that you, you need to bundle the cables to secure them uh, to resist electromechanical forces, I think it, it's almost where we were sort of 10, possibly 10 years ago in EMEA, where everyone knew of it, but we didn't know how to. And I think with uh, with further work, we can we can also push that towards NEC. Okay, good to know. Thank you both for that very detailed information. Fred, we are going to send this next question to you. Can you talk about the Cable Cleat app? Is it available in a format for a Windows laptop, uh, phones? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Absolutely. Thank you. So we developed the Cable Cleat app, and our initial platform and route to market was for uh, the mobile device. Uh, it works both on Android and Apple, and it is downloadable free from the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. So it's a free app. Uh, it's purely technical to, uh, to help engineers make that selection. Uh, we've come out with that app uh, pretty much about uh, April of this year. We launched it, and uh, we're on our second version of that. We've done some improvements. Uh, working with a lot of the EPC firms and the engineering firms, uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback that they really would like a desktop app uh, for that. And the key thing uh, that we're working on, we are working on a desktop app. Uh, it's still in development. Uh, rough timeline is I would like to launch it by the end of the year. Uh, internally, I'm driving for a little sooner than that. So we will... You'll be see that forthcoming for Windows Base because we recognize uh, the engineers are at their workstations designing on CAD or using BIM platforms, and uh, they would like to have that information right at their fingertips. So yes, it's available for free download on Apple and, Go and Google Play. And yes, we will have a free uh, web app based. You don't have to put anything on your computer, and we don't track any information. There's no registration, no login. It's just pure to help people technically. Great. Good to know, Fred. Thanks for that. Thank you. Andy, the next one is for you. Another detailed one, of course. Um, cable cleats, <laughs> cables, and cable trays all expand and contract at different rates. Are there guidelines to follow regarding this thermal ex expansion and contraction? Yeah, thank you. I think this is a great question, very relevant. Um, we, within the IEC standard, we concentrate lots on uh, short circuit withstand and axial and uh, lateral and that sort of thing. But in the real world, when your installation is running, so when it's pulling power and then stopping, so basically it's heating up, cooling down, heating up, all through voltage and all through use, but also through ambient temperature, there are different thermal characteristics between the cable, the ladder, etc. Um, the ladder manufacturers normally have some sort of sliding mechanism between each length of their uh, containment or ladder or tray. So the ladder tends to look after itself, but a big part of a cable designer's task is to lay those cables in that tray to suit thermomechanical movement. So what we don't do is lay them absolutely pin straight on a cold day because what will happen as soon as it's a hot day and as soon as the, the power is running, those cables will expand, the cables have to move somewhere, and damage will occur. So it's a big part of the, the designer's task to either snake the cable or um, alternate cleat type so that the cables can move to deal with thermal mechanical movement. But it's a great question. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, let's see here. I do actually have another question for you, Andy. Uh, of course, you get the very detailed ones. Um, the <laughs> source calculation presented appears to really only be concerned with the center-to-center -center spacing of the actual cables and does not include any consideration of the forces to be constrained for the unsupported or the constrained length of cable. So the required spacing of cleats can be determined. 
Um, note that the foregoing is presumed single conductor cables since multi-conductor cables will already have the overall jacket working to constrain the conductors. But what do we do with that, Andy? Yeah, it's a great question. Again, I think there's two points to that question. The, the spacing of the cleats is vital. Um, Fred covered that in, in his slides. Um, what we do is the IEC looks at it um, and the, the IEC formula looks at it as if the cables act very linear, but of course they don't. Um, also, the IEC standard looks at it as if the cables are unflexible, which they are not. They do move between the cleats. So our multi physics does look at all of those systems and it will give not only a cleat type but a cleat spacing as well depending on that fault level and what the cables are going to do through the fault i think the last point there is very interesting in that um, multi-core cables because they've got possibly armoring or jackets around the three phases will look after themselves in the event of a fault sometimes this is not the case We've carried out many faults over the years on multi-core cables where you would expect the multi-core cable to look after itself, but actually it just bursts between a cleat. We can break that armor. The armor is not there to resist internal forces coming out. The armor is there to protect against external forces coming in. Like said, Fred said, um, mechanical forces so dig outs and, and you know damage to the external jacket of the cable. The armor is not there to resist the forces coming out of the cable due to electromechanical forces. So we look at all of that in the Muldai physics. Very good, thank you. Uh, Fred, we have time for one more question today and this one does go to you. Okay. Does installing nylon wire ties at every rung, so nine inches, provide significant short circuit mitigation? Um, this particular user, this engineer, uh, that, that's what they've been working with. Okay, so absolutely not. So installing nylon uh, wire ties or cable ties or zip ties every nine inch rungs provides very little to no short circuit protection. Now, if the current was exceptionally low, I mean extremely low, you may get some protection, but for working applications with what I would call more in the standard uh, type of current draw that you'll need and the type of peak loads associated with that, Nylon cable ties provide no protection whatsoever for short circuit. And that is a big misconception we see, especially in North America. And I've faced that firsthand on installation sites where when we talk about the NEC code and it says shall be properly restrained and people say, well, I put nylon cable ties on it. The tensile, loop tensile strength even of the best cable ties and Pandua does make some darn good cable ties, will not protect you against short circuit events. Okay, awesome. Um, Andy, you have 30 seconds. You've got a quick answer <laughs> here to a quick question. Do multi-conductor cables need cleats from a standards perspective? Okay, very quickly, guys. Remember the NEC requirement, 39220. Uh, we need to bind those cables to resist electromechanical forces. And unless the cable manufacturer can give you absolute guarantee, then you need to consider cable cleats. All right, thank you so much. We covered a lot here today. Thank you to the audience for the great questions. And thank you, Fred Dorman and Andy Booth for sharing your time and expertise and I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Panduit, for sponsoring today's event. And now that we are just about done, we want to hear how we did. An audience survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer, 
and CFE Media, I'd like to thank you for attending. This now concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.